know the American media, slightly unlike the British media, I think, although I think the other you know, sectors of the British media are getting there, uh, you are fed a much more insular kind of diet of news in America. The than most we get corrupt here. media in the world, I would say, although well, the well, competition think, is intense. Well, yeah, okay. Um, but, if, but there's so much stuff out there on the internet now. Most people, I would assume, in America ignore it still and say, sorry, we just don't believe it. Because, let's face it, it's very easy to start a conspiracy theory. Well, my first thing, conspiracy, it used to be a conspiracy theory, but now it's been proven. So, it's so why, are, why aren't the Amer so if it's so, <laughs> so obvious and it's so proven, why aren't the American people standing up and saying enough? Well, some of them are, but, and, yeah, but, and but I the just cited, majority aren't them, I cited the polling data. The problem is you have the Democratic Party, strangely enough, is more dedicated to the 9-11 myth than the Republicans, because the Democrats say, we're the true church of the 9-11 myth. Right. Bush went astray into Iraq, but we are the ones who keep saying, bin Laden, bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda, and now we have the U.S. destabilizing Pakistan. Interesting story. Cheney went to Pakistan at the end of February, and he hmm. said to Musharraf, guess what? You will now attack Iran with your Islamic bomb. And Musharraf, much to his credit, said no. And what you see, the hysteria right now, is a U.S.-British destabilization of Pakistan because he refused to join in the war against Iran. Where does this all end, though? Because surely the credibility of the American government, if what you're saying is true, is in such tatters. How can they continue to, you know, how can the, British, the, the American people and indeed governments from around the world continue to support them and accept what they're saying? Well, we hope that they won't. Uh, I would say uh, being a member of NATO right now is something like being a member of a suicide pact. I would mm -hmm. not do it. I was in Canada. I urged them to rethink being a member of NATO. I would say the same thing here. Then it's your affair, but you really have to think where does whether it end, you though? want to be dragged And how in. does it end? Because if you follow this through to its logical conclusion, where do we end up? Well, you know, in the U.S., we have a history of, of producing these social movements at various times. I think right now, I would certainly say impeachment of Bush-Cheney is a mass movement. You can drive across the United States and you can see middle class or even you know, upper middle class neighborhoods mm -hmm. with big signs, impeach him, impeach both of them, impeach Bush, impeach Cheney. That's a mass movement. How long has he got to go now? It's about, what, 18 months, is it? Less than um, that? J January 20th, 2009. But right. remember, the Spanish uh, tactic, of course, is if you have big terrorism, you can declare a state of emergency and call off elections. And do, you think that, do you think that might happen discussed. then? I think that's a real danger. A lot of Democrats have these countdown clocks. You can buy a watch right. that tells you how many more days, hours, and minutes of Bush, except it's a fallacy because that assumes that there's going to be legality. And the whole thing is what Cheney's thinking of is new 9-11, attack on Iran, and martial law. If, and there's no reason if for If there it. is an election and the Democrats do get back into power, as some people think they will, is that going to make the, the matter any better, or are they in on it as well? Uh, it depends think? a little bit on who it is. Uh, right. Mrs. Clinton, I'm afraid, is a warmonger who has actually tried to profile herself as being more aggressive on Iran than Bush. There was a phase of about two years where Bush was always saying, let the Germans and the French do the negotiation. Mrs. Clinton was attacking him from the right, from the warmonger side, saying, I'll attack Iran faster than he will, and I can get you European troops and European money that Bush can't get you. So Mrs. Clinton would be a disaster. Right. She would guarantee eight more years of war in Iraq. And I think that is a growing... She voted for this Kyle well, Lieberman just amendment. Just talking about Iraq for a minute, what do we do about it right now? Because obviously we've got ourselves embroiled in this, and it's a mess. I mean, anybody who's seen what's going on around knows it's a mess. Do we pull out? Do Absolutely pull out. I, I think well, the, what the does British, that do to the country? The, the instinct of the British uh, uh, general staff and so forth is correct. You have to get out of there. It's futile slaughter. However, the U.S. also has to get out at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to have 150,000 U.S. forces above Baghdad. But you can't go into a country, totally destroy it, bring it to its knees, and then just leave it to sort it out. No, I wouldn't do that either. I would have a comprehensive Marshall Plan for the economic reconstruction of the Middle East, from which all states in the region, including the Israelis, the Lebanese, uh, everybody's been savaged by war, mm -hmm. rebuild the whole place, make Jerusalem into a transportation hub. It's the point where Africa and Asia and Europe come together. It ought to be one of the most prosperous um, uh, entrepots mm. uh, and warehousing areas uh, in the world, and, and you could do that, but you have to have peace. Now, the, the danger is, if you leave those U.S. forces in Iraq, eventually you're dealing with a very capable enemy. Uh, the whole U.S. situation right now is the U.S. supply line goes across the Iranian front, think of it, for 1,500 miles, and then you get to the land, it's two roads, each are 400 miles long, so-called Route Tampa, going from Kuwait City to Baghdad. And it's very easy to cut those supply lines. Everything goes up there. Gasoline, mm. water, ammunition, 
uh, fuel, uh, everything. If you cut those, the U.S. forces are essentially pocketed. And then you have Dunkirk, if you're lucky, and Stalingrad, if you're not so lucky. Who's ultimately pulling the strings behind all of this? It is the, um, the Anglo-American financier establishment. It extends from the city of London to Wall Street and then to Washington. Um, it's about money, obviously, uh, ultimately. It's ultimately about world domination and the continuation of U.S.-British w- world domination. And this is what you see. Hmm. The Bush-Blair combination is simply an expression of what's going on in the ruling elite. I would look at people like Rupert Murdoch, look at people like um, George Shultz, uh, who was Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Labor, very important person. Th- this is the neocon wing, again, I would say neocon or neo-fascist wing of the U.S. ruling elite, and, and they're the, the, the aggressive ones. There's another group, a body of opinion around James Baker, and some others, which is more traditional imperialist, which says, play them against each other, but don't you get involved, right? Mm. In other words, divide and conquer, but not with your own forces. Whereas the neocons, the neocons are one-trick ponies. You show a neocon a problem, he always has one answer. War, invade, bomb. Here's their perspective. U.S., Britain, and Israel against the world forever. This is no future for Britain or for anybody. Look ahead 25 years from now, where are we going to be with all this? Well, I, I, of course, uh, maintain a great uh, optimism. I think that under the blows of this crisis, uh, we'll we'll solve our biggest problem, which is lethargy, demoralization, apathy, passivity. You can already see the U.S. uh, Mm. voter turnout statistics are creeping up. The younger generation on the whole is more politically aware than its immediate predecessor. Uh, But right now, I would recommend we have these movements, right? uh, Anti-war, anti-globalization, impeachment, labor. We have lots of good movements. They tend to be single-issue movements. What you've got to do is merge them, create a mass movement outside of the parties, independent of any financier control, because we have a lot of leftists who are controlled by George Soros and other financiers, but have a, uh, a program, stop all wars, roll back the police state, impeach Bush Cheney, People have to be the beneficiaries of economics, not financiers. Isn't this going to take so almost like and a revolution? And 9-11 truth. 9-11 truth. Well, isn't this going to take the best part of a revolution to make this happen, though? Yes, but I, I hope it's a, it's a political uh, process. Sure. In other words, I, I think any, any uh, notion but, but, of but violence again, is absurd. You see, we were saying earlier on the program about voting in elections, and we were saying, and a lot of people in this country feel as well, I think, uh, uh, many people always vote. Many people say, again, on the, on the phone, and they've said to me many times, what's the point in voting? Because yeah. they all do what they want to do anyway. You know, there's That's always an agenda politics. there. That's not politics. You've got to go beyond that. In other words, hmm. Politics means activism. My slogan on this tour, because I'm trying to do something about this, is you have two choices. Right. Get active or get radioactive. And right. active means active. It doesn't mean voting every four years. It means getting engaged yourself as an activist. And what I say in the U.S. to people, of course, is... You don't like the state of affairs, run for office. We are now looking for 469 people to help save the U.S. and the world, which is we have an election next year, 435 members of the House, 34 members of the Senate. That's what we've got to have, plus, of course, supporters. But we need candidates, basically, in every district who will say, again, no more wars, roll back the police state, impeach Bush, Cheney, people rule, not bankers, 9-11 truth. And I think that's a package to begin with. Right? And then obviously, you've got to elaborate the economic part where there's a lot of disagreement. That would take a while. But mm-hmm. uh, in this country, I heard your discussion. It sounds like some of your callers think that somehow holding office is a matter for the elite, mm-hmm. and we're just the masses. Mrs. Pelosi, the current Speaker of the House, expressed the same idea from the other direction. She said she was sick and tired of peace demonstrators camping in front of her house. Mm-hmm. And she said, those are merely advocates. We are leaders. And then she's trying to explain why she didn't impeach Bush, why she's voting the money for the Iraq war. Uh, it's time it's for such people to get the uh, gate. In other words, they should be ushered to the door, right. thanked for their services, and sent into well-deserved well, they retirement. Oh, interesting stuff. We're out of time, sadly. We could go on talking for hours. If you want to find out more, uh, Webster will be there tonight uh, at the QEH Theatre on Jacobswell Road at 7. Tickets are £5 on the door. First come, first served. Get along. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you're good.